Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 207, we're going to talk a little bit more about microphonic tubes. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. To help understand what microphonic tubes are, we've set up a wee bench experiment. Now, all tubes are microphonic. Let me repeat that. All tubes are microphonic. Okay, that was boring. <laughs> it's just that some are lower and some are higher. Some are so low you won't even notice it at all. Yeah. In fact, some of the best sounding tubes tend to have higher microphonics. Vintage mothered 12AX7s, among others, are famous for this. Now, when microphonics, and of course, those Muller 12AX7s are famous for their sonics as well. And there's lots of good examples of, of that. Um, in fact, the tube that we've got in um, the original um, kit phono uh, preamp are um, Sylvania rebased uh, 7F7. So they're essentially a 6SL7 GT. And the, uh, they're one of the very early versions. It's, yeah, and it's also a, a high gain tube, lower than the 12x7, but with a mu of 70, it's, it's in the high gain category. Uh, and, and I don't think we mentioned that actually. The higher the gain, the, the more microphonic they tend to be. Ah, yes. That's why it takes two of us to make these videos. <laughs> um, two half of brains makes one, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Some of the time. Maybe. <laughs> Sometime we're, we're only getting close. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got our, our mom's wee uh, Yorkie Terrier uh, visiting us for a couple of weeks. And um, so we've got his half a brain, too. So, mm. mind you, it's half a dog brain. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, he's looking at us. He's not happy. Um, he always knows when we're talking about him. Uh, so, when microphonics get excessive, you'll hear a ring that echoes. So it'll just keep on echoing. So it's not just a ring in which you tap the tube and you get a little, a little sort of a, a bell off of it. Um, it'll just keep on going. So you'll get a ring, a ring, a ring, a ring, a ring, a and, ring. And that's when microphonics are a problem. Yep. Or uh, if you just literally just touch the amp, you just touch it and it the tube rings, then that's a problem. Or, or even walk near it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Um, otherwise, don't discard a tube that is um, slightly <laughs> microphonic because that might actually be one of the best sounding tubes you own. Okay, so we're going to switch around the bench a little bit and uh, and we'll uh, we'll see what we can find with the scope. Uh, okay, you ready, Charles? Yeah, let's switch places here. Okay, so we've set up a little bit of a demo here with our original 6 or 12 SL7 Phono Kit preamp. And we have, as Dad said, these rebased 7F7s that are in here. These are the old Sylvania back to back plate types. They sound absolutely amazing, but their noise floor is a little bit higher, mm -hmm. and their microphonics are a little bit higher. And one of the I mean, the reason we're running this set is because it's a nice close mass set, but one of the tubes is unacceptably microphonic. Yeah, so it, we can't sell it, but it's one of the mainstays in our system because it works just fine and the microphonics aren't enough to cause a problem for us. And it sounds amazing, but mm -hmm. it's not a tube that we would send out. So one of them has got a nice little elastic around it, and that's the one that we deem to be too microphonic. And the other tube that matches it is actually as good as as good as this type of tube gets so it will ring but it it's not really, it doesn't continue ringing it's yeah. not a microphonic tube so at the very beginning of the signal chain we have a signal generator yep that's this wire coming into the amplifier here and it's putting in an appropriately small five millivolt voltage to simulate uh, a phono connection at one kilohertz at one kilohertz and we can see we have our scope hooked up here, seeing that one kilohertz sine wave. Now, for those of you that don't know, one kilohertz is pretty much dead dead in the middle of the audio spectrum and is 
right in the mid range. And it's really the only thing we can use for this test because of the way the Phono RIAA circuit works. If we put in a lower frequency, it's going to be massive. If you put in a higher frequency, it's going to be really tiny. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tap this tube here and we're going to watch the sine wave and see if it fluctuates at all. And let's see what happens. Nope, nothing there. And now, when you tap a tube like that for microphonics, you have to tap with something that has got no no very lightweight, no mass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not hitting this thing with a hammer, or you're not flicking it, or yeah. anything like that. It doesn't need much. Yeah, so it's a very light tap. In fact, I actually, when we're testing tubes for customers, we actually mostly use. Um, a little tiny stylus brush that's really has got no mass to it at all. It probably weighs um, what half a gram or something like that. Yep, and you just give it a little whack whack, and you'll tell right away if it's microphonic or not. So uh, I didn't see any real fluctuation here in the sine wave. Let's do that again just to double check. Yeah. Now there's a slight instability in the. This is a of course a, a digital scope, and it's trying to capture the signal. In real time of course and you you will see a little tiny bit of instability particularly with amps like this that's a very high gain amp it's got two stages of gain in order to get the low uh, phono cartridge signal up to uh, about one volt rms which is uh, line voltage in most systems so yeah so so let's switch over to the other channel here and I, uh i think we can do it in real time while yeah. everyone watches hopefully we don't blow something up these are all low voltage connections so it's not it's not a, a hazard to a scope but um oh we lost our ground there sorry my arm's in the way on the screen your hairy arm <laughs> and there we go we're back okay now we should put a caution in because last week uh, we did a, uh, a live uh, mains test and somebody came onto the comments with exclamation marks and capital letters and basically shouting at me in the comment section. Now, first of all, that's totally inappropriate conduct. Even if you have a good point to make, you don't shout in the comment section. We're happy to get good feedback and conversations going, but you have to do it the right way. Yeah, and you have to provide uh, a reasonable amount of discourse and, um, and of course, evidence. Anyways, um, when you're working with a scope, you've always got to show precautions. So I can't go into all the safety operations of a scope but just make sure that you read your manual, that you, if you're new to working with an oscilloscope, that you, um, that you follow uh, some good videos online in which they talk about safety procedures, particularly voltage inputs onto, here's the input lead right here, that's all the way over to here, you can barely see it. Um, so you don't blow up your scope basically. So these are fairly delicate instruments, but if they're set up properly and you exercise reasonable precautions, mm -hmm. you won't have a problem. This, this scope's been on my bench for years and we've never had a problem with yeah, it. We have yet to kill it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So back to the test here. So now we're on the other channel with the uh, slightly microphonic tube here. We've got our one kilohertz sine wave. Watch what happens whenever I tap it here. Just a light tap. Ah. You see that fluctuation? Now it is going back to normal here, so you can tell that the ringing isn't propagating. It isn't staying for any more than a second or two. So this is a tube that we would consider to be acceptably microphonic, at least for our own use. Yeah, it's right, it's right on the borderline between uh, go going crazy and working fine in the system. So it works fine in the system, but if I was to, let's say, turn a big heavy switch that that makes, you know, it has a physical, yeah. large physical, let's do that again, large physical action, you can see that the, even though that's the filament switch, the microphonics of the tube, you could see that it reacted to it. So it's right on the edge, but it's it's fine for uh, for our own critical listening system. Um, we, and I think if you were to put this 
uh, if you were to put this into a system in which somebody's playing extremely loud uh, prog rock, or, yeah, the vibrations or, ED, or EDM especially, yeah, the vibrations might propagate through the tube, and then you may have problems. I think that's a particular issue with guitar players whenever they've got a head that's built right into a cabinet or something like On that. On the other hand, they may really like the sound, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> and we get a request saying, "Please send more tubes like that." And it's like, oh, this, they're not that easy to find. Oh yeah, we try not to. <laughs> so let's do the tapping test one more time so uh, everybody can see. Okay. Yeah, you see? Now, what's happening here is that the stability of the tube, its ability to amplify the signal. Now, remember, these are 6SL7 equivalents, so there's two uh, tubes inside one bottle, and we're using both of these high gain stages to amplify a very low signal. And in between the two amplification stages is the equalization stage. So, the microphonics um, have a lot of amplification and a lot of EQ in which it can essentially interfere with the signal. So when Charles taps it, mm -hmm. it's, it's not surprising that a slightly microphonic, or I would call this a moderately microphonic tube, that the signal becomes inst instable. Unstable. <laughs> in is instable a uh, word? I don't think so. Hmm? That's inside of where you keep horses, isn't it? Instable? Yeah, in the stable. In the stable. Yeah. Unstable. Um, so, and with any luck, uh, Charles has got a recording going right now. With any luck, uh, we can put it up. Uh, and you can hear the difference and hear the ring happen in real time. Yeah, if you don't, if we don't get the recording up, it's because it just didn't work out. Yeah. Now we do have that one kilohertz tone on there, so if it is going up, it's just going to be a short segment and hopefully just a little bit with the ring in there, so you can hear it. Okay. Now we've we've come and cycled through this uh, topic a number of times, and it, the reason why we do uh, cycle through it fairly often and uh, with different approaches is is because. Of all the issues with vacuum tubes that people who are just getting into tubes um, um, have to learn and understand mm. is what what makes for a microphonic tube, what makes for a microphonic a tube that's too microphonic, yeah. and and also the fact that you may actually want a slight bit of microphonics in your signal path. Yeah, all depending on the setup and the sound and everything. Um, but it's it's just hard for people that are new to the hobby or or new to tubes in general um, to know what a microphonic or a noisy tube or any of these basics are, what it sounds like, what it means. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that was a bit of fun. Yeah. So let's clear the deck and uh, take a look at what came in. We have some great stuff for you. Okay, Charles, what, what came in this uh, week? A whole bunch of stuff, including some of our favorite tubes. So earlier you were mentioning uh, the Mullard 12AX7, which is a favorite of a lot of people. And is basically an extinct tube now. Almost every example that we've seen show up in the last couple of years has been poorly testing, unbalanced sections, microphonics. Mm -hmm. So it was with great joy that... Uh, that we found, I noticed I said we, <laughs> you found. The, the Matsushita 12EX7s that were made on Muller tooling because they have probably 95% of the sound of those great Muller tubes, but with lower noise, lower microphonics, yeah, uh, they're almost, still available. Almost all of the, the goodness of the Muller 12AX7 um, with the quality manufacturing of uh, Matsushita, which of course is a Japanese company, and they the Matsushita, as far as I know, made all of their tubes in Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, we almost never have a problem with microphonics or noise. Oh, they're great. So we, we managed to get in some more uh, more used than new, but we have some new old stock. We have some uh, used stock that is testing fantastic, and we've got some matched pairs of those in the store. And as usual with these high gain tubes, we also have a section for ones that are mismatched for all you guitar players out there. So these are great options to replace uh, noisy or bad 12AX7s and those amps. And we've got some more Japanese tubes here. These are the Toshiba 6CG7 or 6FQ7s. And these, of course, are 6SN7 equivalents in a 9-pin bottle. We've got an adapter somewhere around here. Actually, I think we might have just used it on the other amp 
Uh, yeah, I'll go grab it. You yeah. keep going. Anyway, so these are, are great tubes. They'll work in any spot design for a 6SN7 with the right adapter, of course. And we've just been hearing great things about them constantly. So we're always trying to get more in. Just like with the 12AX7s, we have uh, new old stock. We have good used. And um, and these are great tubes. Uh, they just they do something magical with the, the sound stage, with the separation of the instruments. And they just have a great balance overall in their representation. And I think that is coming back here with the adapter. Yeah, you really moved that amp. <laughs> so there it is. Here's here's a nine pin to octal adapter. This is actually uh, one that's we've had a lot of use on, so it's a little bit tarnished. And of course, we send nice, brightly polished adapters out to you. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing much to it because the 6CG7 is, is is essentially a 6SN7 in a miniature 9-pin bottle, so it's just a matter of repinning it. Yep, so it's uh, it's nice and simple. And now, yeah, caution, not all, not all adapters uh, uh, will have, let me get that in focus, not all adapters will have the, the correct uh, uh, pin, uh, pin out, yep. pin out, because there's uh, a couple of different standard base types and a lot of them are not actually set up for uh, the 6CG7 types. So you have to be very careful whenever you're getting an adapter. We sell the correct ones for these. Uh, other people do online as well so you can find them but just be cautious and read thoroughly what it says it does. Yeah in fact when we first ordered the adapter from um, uh, uh, Amtata who makes uh, all of our adapters and does some custom work for us as well um, he sent three emails in a row saying are you sure are you sure <laughs> because everybody else orders the other adapter yeah. and of course yes 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 yep. <laughs> we're yeah. sure we got the right one and lastly here we actually managed to get in some more Svetlana 6550Cs, one of our favorite KT88 type power tubes. This is, of course, the original Svetlana St. Petersburg production. You can tell right away by those rectangular holes. And um, these are just fantastic tubes. And we got in a small number of very lightly used ones that I think we still have to put through the tester. Yeah, I don't think we have a quad yet. Um, and personally if you can i know they're expensive but if you can afford it with power tubes especially but all tubes if there's a new old stock uh, version available uh, of a quality vintage tube always go for the new old stock if you can afford it if it's available uh, it just gives you uh, more longevity um, it'll give you the best sounding tube possible but often the the used tubes can be a bit of a bargain because we don't put any garbage used tubes in the store, so yeah. um, you end up with at least a good tube. So good testing numbers, low microphonics, low noise, but if it's used, it's used, right? Nobody really knows how many hours are on that tube. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a crapshoot, but that's testing helps take some of the risk out of that yeah we do everything we can to make sure that they're rock solid before we send them out and of course we test new old stock tubes to the same standard we test used tubes yeah, too as well they can still technically fail and it's very uncommon with these these beautiful vintage tubes like the svetlanas but it can happen yeah okay what else do you got to show off did you show off your new boxes charles oh well actually these are our new nine pin boxes let me see if i can get that in focus for years we've been trying to find reasonably affordable boxes for all of our tubes because a lot of even new old stock tubes that are 50 60 70 years old even not we have 90 year old tubes believe it or not mm -hmm. um we've, I've, we've still got some tubes in stock that are new old stock that are older than my dad yeah. um who just turned 89 uh, this past week. And um, the, the, the tubes arrive sometimes in boxes that are in tatters. It's really rare to find a, an older tube that's a half a century or older. With an intact box. With an intact yeah. box. It happens sometimes though, but then of course you start handling and it starts falling apart. So, yeah. Yeah. so uh, we had a lot of nine pin tubes also that were bulk packed and we don't like to ship them unless they're properly protected. So that's what these guys are for. So we're slowly getting uh, generic boxes in um, that look good, that uh, are the right size 
And so they're a little bit bigger than a standard nine pin box, but that also lets us put in some extra padding on them. Yeah. 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 And I like, I actually like a box that's big enough in which we can fit little padding power tubes in particular. If you look at this, uh, how much oversized it is. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, um, many, uh, power tubes came with a sort of a corrugated, uh, cardboard liner. And sometimes we'll reuse that in, if it's in really good shape, but often what we'll do is we'll just wrap the tube in bubble wrap and then put it inside the box. And we'll even do that with smaller tubes. And, um, and that just helps, uh, guarantee, uh, safer shipping. Um, yeah. So if you stayed till the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. People have been grabbing codes left and right and center. In fact, last month was an insane month. It's just finally starting to slow down. At one point, it took us almost a week to catch up to orders. It was just crazy. Um, but you know, the, the fall is here. People are buying kit amps left, right, and center because the, you know, people are, you're not at the cottage, you're not fishing anymore, you're not going to the beach, uh, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere anyways. In the Southern Hemisphere, our Australian customers, um, they're just heading into their summer, so woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah, there's a lot of activity in the kid amp business because, uh, you know, people start doing their indoor hobbies and, and I think that's the reason why we're getting so many tube orders as well, because uh, people just, you know, you've got time, uh, it gets dark early in the evening, you're time at home. listen to some good music. Yeah, so, and the same thing's happening at our home as well. Anyways, uh, feel free to grab a cheers code. There's a secret code that's easy to figure out. And we can reach most of you with flat rate $20 shipping. But if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.